God, Christ, and the Spirit of God in Revelation, in the book of Revelation particularly, as we'll say that. And uh, so let's, I'll just show you what I'm thinking about and you see what you think, okay? The great characters of the story. And that's critical to understanding rightly the story. So I like this uh, Herman Melville's wonderful classic, Moby Dick. But what if you thought Ahab, uh, he's, he's a whale. And Moby Dick, he's the mariner. And Ishmael, we don't know for sure what he is. He's the shy member of the group or something. We don't know what the, how that works. But, but if, we, if we did this, and then we said, we began to talk about, and these three characters are all equal substance and stuff like, I, you know, hey, I don't know that we've ever been a bestseller that, under those circumstances. So that's what I'm saying. You've got to get the great characters of the story in focus accurately, or how are we ever going to get the story right? It just doesn't make any sense, though. So we're talking about God and His Christ, Revelation 11, 15, and then let's take a look at some overview statements that I'm making as we approach this getting the characters right. The, the great characters of the Revelation, by the way, are God and His Christ. So, but we want to understand them in the same way that the writer of this book would have intended for them to be understood, right? You can't beat that. I, I can't beat the writer of the book, I don't think. He, he had these things in mind. He, he had understanding in these matters. And the best I think I would hope to do is to understand it as well as he did. I could, I'm working on that, right? So here's the point of this. The Revelation is not a Trinitarian book. I think that's a critical statement, and maybe we can help our friends sometimes who are interested in all the symbols and the, all of these amazing things. Take a little time here first and sort out, you know, where is this at, and you know, what is the key issue, and what, who are the key characters? How does that work? But we can rest assured that the Revelation is not really a Trinitarian book. There are no Trinitarian statements in the book of Revelation. None that I can find, none. No Trinitarian scenes. In other words, John is seeing all these amazing things, you know, these wonderful scenes in, in Revelation. And wow, there's no scene in Revelation that's a Trinitarian scene, if you will. It's not happening. And I think, I've, I've said this and I think it makes sense, this is a testimony, I think, to its earliness. Because we've had some folks come along and say, well, you know, I don't like Revelation, let's throw it out. Uh, usually, when you get ready to throw out things in the Bible, it starts out with the premise, I don't like it. Uh, but here we are, I think, in the case of the book of Revelation, when you begin to look at it and you realize what it is saying and what it's not saying, then it's not hard at that point uh, to realize, hey, this is not something from the third or fourth century, and it's not something filled with Trinitarian ideas and all that business. But instead, it is absolutely wonderfully filled with, guess what? People who believe what we believe. It's wonderful. That's the picture that we see in this, in this writing, in this book. So I think, when I look at it that way, and I think, folks will surely agree, many, uh, that that's a testimony. This is pre-Nicene stuff by far. It's pre-whatever came after stuff, even pre-second century stuff and so on. This is really getting back to, yeah, us. I think we're on the right page, if I may use that word, uh, in this. Also, I will allege this. It was not a modalistic or oneness writing. Okay, that, that it, Jesus is not the Father in the book of Revelation. You can't find it. So that's an interesting thing, because that was my background. And uh, so I grew up in that background, and so did my wife, Sharon. And uh, uh, so we uh, have come along, and, and what we understand and, you know, works much better for us now. This is, this. I like this. It's much more coherent. It makes such good sense. But I don't think the modalist or the person who is a oneness mode of thinking, again, a little play on words, but the, uh, I don't think that they're going to find anything to help them in the book of Revelation. It just doesn't work. 
Jesus is nowhere in the book of Revelation the Father. So it doesn't work. It doesn't help. Neither, and I'll allege this too, neither was it an Arian writing. Uh, they were not celebrating and talking about an eternal Jesus. I think that's interesting and important too. So all of these later developments, I don't think you're going to find them. In fact, I'm confident you will not find these in this wonderful writing, in this wonderful book. So we have people interested in the book of Revelation. Maybe we could encourage them. Just read it with a good open mind and think about these issues. And it may help you to see a little more clearly where we're at and why we are where we're at. So I think clearly the book of Revelation was written and read originally by people who believe exactly what we believe about God and Jesus. Now, that's not, I'm not boasting about that. I'm just happy about it. I'm thankful for it. I know we're blessed in that. So, the Revelation, clearly one individual who is God in this, and I said this is us. The only one who is God is the one sitting on the throne in Revelation 4 and 1, and that beginning of that great scene. Okay. Jesus, on the other hand, is the Christ, the Lamb who dies. Revelation 1.18, I was dead, and see, I'm alive forever and ever, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. That's where Jesus comes in. So God sits on the throne, the, the, the primary phone, throne, the high throne, if you will, the highest throne. Jesus is actually then identified as the one who died. Now he's alive, but not as the one who's on the throne in Revelation 4 and 1 at the beginning of this. Okay. Only one then is God, and that is the Father. Jesus speaks directly of his Father in Revelation. So you do hear the word Father spoken, and it's equivalent to God. Okay, so in the early uh, writing to the, to the various churches in Asia, Jesus is speaking about his God and Father. So we're talking about God being the Father. Revelation 5, Jesus is the one then before the throne. Not on the throne, but before the throne. And clearly distinguished between him, him and God. And Him and the Father. So, again, that's why I'm saying my modalism past doesn't work here. It just doesn't, I don't think it works anywhere, but it, does, it certainly doesn't work here. So, just a few thoughts about all of this. God is defined as the God of Christ some six times. And uh, you hopefully will be familiar with this, but uh, we'll just take a quick look at them. So in Revelation 1 and 6, we find this, And he has made us to be a kingdom, we read this earlier, a priest to his God and Father. Ha! There it is. I, my point is made. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Then in the third chapter, the second verse, Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of God. My God. Yes, I love it. So this is amazing, but these are instances, this one's an instance in which Jesus himself is speaking. And it's beautiful, but he has a God. Wow. Revelation 3 and 12 he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God. And the name of the city of my God. The new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Wow. I love that. And this is a very powerful verse. You know, it's so emphatic. Uh, you know, what, if Jesus would have just said it one more time, then would you believe it? I don't know. He's, he's trying to help us, uh, I think, as, as much as he can. By the way, I just wondered about this, you may have too, but why is Jesus never called the God of the Father? I don't, I don't get it. They're all supposed to be co-equal, co-power, co-eternal, and all those other co's that you could, might imagine. But it's interesting. It's always his Father is his God. I don't think there's any clear case where you would say, oh, but Jesus is the God of the Father. Huh. No. Well, why not? Well, it doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't, does it? Okay.
So, but the Father is repeatedly the God of Jesus, both on earth now, we've noticed in heaven as well. And so why is Jesus never the God of God? Just something to think about. Okay, so think of this. The word Christ, according to my account, occurs about ten times in the book of Revelation. It is never once equal to God. Check me out. I, I think I, I do not fear uh, that you will bring to me any successful refutation on this point. It's, it's true. So ten times Jesus is the Christ. The word God occurs 90 times, and never once does that equal Christ or Jesus. So this book, I'm telling you again, we got to meet the guy that wrote this book because he's one of us, wasn't he? He had this thing down very well. At least three times, God is clearly the creator. Okay, and let's take a look at him because I think that's important. In the fourth chapter, in the 11th verse, worthy are you our Lord and our God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created and I, I'm just making a note this is all singular stuff it's all one person being addressed here so uh, and I, I love this these statements you created all things and it just reminded me of Acts 4 24 where the apostles had that disciples had that wonderful prayer and the place was shaken. It was amazing. You, Lord, are God who made the heaven, the sea, and the earth, and all that is in them. Right? And then I think we can find a parallel in, in, the, uh, in the Old Testament. So this, again, is to God on the throne. The Lamb, that's in the fourth chapter, as you notice. And Jesus, the Christ, the Lamb, does not appear until the fifth chapter. Very clearly distinguished. So uh, that then is referencing God as the creator. One thing I was noticing the other day, and you may have noticed it too, the, the, the matter in Isaiah 44, 24, where we're talking about, you know, God is speaking, if we want to believe him, but he's saying, you know, I did this alone. I did it all myself. And people say, well, yeah, but he had, you know, somebody acting as his agent, and so now they want agents, right? So anyway... <laughs> But it does not work. And I just think, because I was no, what I was noticing the other day is, I just got thinking, well, he's describing the work of creation. He's not, he's not talking about any intermediary in creation. He's not talking about doing it through an agent of any kind. And uh, we might find that in the new creation, and Jesus being the agent of that. But in this Genesis creation, it is amazing that God says, I did the work of it. I spread out. I did this work. I created it. He's saying, like, with my own hands, so to speak. There is no other person involved in that creation. In the 10th chapter, in verse 6, the angel swore by him, notice more singulars on, on all this, who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, that there'll be no more delay. So, wow, uh, this is amazing that we're talking about who did this creating. And it never, in the book of Revelation, it's never Jesus. And if you could find it at all, clearly it would relate to the new creation. Because, and uh, that's uh, what we're seeing then. The 14th chapter, verse 7, and he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him, all these singulars everywhere, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and springs of water. And He had just said the first fruits to God and to the Lamb, distinguishing the two. And here He's talking about fear God. So the one, God and the Lamb, this is the, the one who is God in that equation that we could give glory because He uh, has... Uh, done these amazing things. He made all these things. So, wow. Advancing to this thought a little bit then, in the Revelation, the Holy Spirit is not a person in addition to the Father. And this is my thought. We, and we should know these things well. And I will say this. I've noticed 
that for a lot of folks, it's kind of easier for the lights to go on in their understanding about the Holy Spirit. And if they, if they get that and they begin to say, oh, I see this, okay, then they are perhaps more able to go on and advance to more understanding and other things. So, but the Holy Spirit is never worshipped, never prayed to, has no throne. Wow, okay. So, and that's the case actually throughout the entire Bible. Uh, it's amazing. I, I've said before, even when the psalmist speaks of the Spirit of God, he doesn't speak to the Spirit of God. He speaks to the one on the throne whose Spirit it is. He says, take not your Holy Spirit from me. He doesn't even, you know, it's about the Spirit of God, but he prays to the one whose Spirit it is. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. So, there's no prayer to the Holy Spirit. It doesn't work that way. Okay. In Revelation, the Father is God, and the myriads call him our God nine times. Not once is the phrase used of the Trinity. Not once is Jesus or a person called the Holy Spirit referred to as our God. Check me out. I think that's, that's going to be pretty easy. Okay. I think it's clear that the, what we've learned about the Spirit of God in other places is true here as well. The Spirit is God. It is the Father. The one seated on the highest throne. The work of the Spirit is equated with the work of the risen, glorified Christ. Now, that's an interesting thought. And so I'm kind of pivoting here to think about something for just a moment with you. Okay. And here's where you can find it, I think, most pronounced. To each of the seven churches, okay, notice this refrain. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's exciting. But notice in every case, all seven cases, that the one who has done the speaking, the one who gives the message, is always the glorified Christ. That's, that's interesting, isn't it? And so, actually, I think this is in line with what Jesus said would be the case after he was glorified. And, but look how it's actually looking in action. How it's happening in action. So, how can this happen? Well, actually, because God can pretty much do anything, he has caused the Christ to be able to continue with his people by his spirit. So the glorified Christ, and here's an example of this in Laodicea, the third chapter, verse 20 uh, in Revelation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Okay. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, now listen, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now the refrain, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the seven churches or to the churches. So this is an interesting area that, that you know, we've worked on some, but I would encourage you, look into this some more if you, if you, you may already have, but if you haven't, Look into this. The, the work of the glorified Messiah, as God has determined it, through the Spirit of God. Okay. And, and of course we find this referenced in the teens of John, as we would say. So here we might look at John 16, 15. Jesus said that the Spirit will take what is mine and disclose it to you. So wow. And I think that's what we're seeing happening here. So it is the Spirit speaking, but it is the Messiah whose, whose voice is heard then. So that's exciting. That can be. Yes, it can, because God is God. And He can give whatever authority, power, and ability to whomever He desires. Wow. Uh, so... Revelation 1 and 8, we often have people wanting to know about that, and basically it comes from this, uh, that uh, they are reading their red letter, <laughs> their red letter Bible. I like that. I, I had an aunt said, Jesus is the only one who could write with a red pencil. So, <laughs> so this is exciting. But, but anyway, uh, so what you have is this statement, I'm Alpha and Omega, 
the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So they're looking at that and saying, well, Jesus then is the Almighty, because they're equating it with Jesus. But I think, and you can take a look at the context here, but in reality, of course, it is a, a fair textual issue, uh, an error in the red lettering. Somebody had to decide to put that in red letters, but, but actually uh, uh, NAS, NRSV, NIV, and about any other modern translation has recognized uh, that it is the Lord God, and it's the theos here that's been omitted, right? Uh, Revelation 1 and 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So it's interesting that at 21st we receive quite a bit of mail, as it were, emails. And I hear this every once in a while from someone. Well, Jesus is the Almighty. So, uh, but actually Jesus is not in the Bible anywhere declared to be the Almighty. You can say he's mighty, whatever might God has given him. Yeah. But to say he's the Almighty, no, that, that doesn't work, so scripturally. Uh, here's another thought I might, thought we might touch on because we have people writing it occasionally along this line. See what you think. And uh, you may have some other thoughts about this or the way you understand it, but we have this phrase, Alpha and Omega. We just read one of them uh, just a moment ago. And, uh, but it occurs legitimately, if I can put it that way, three times in the book of Revelation once in Revelation 1 and 8, which we just read, where God is speaking of himself and calls himself the Alpha and Omega. And then we have verse 11 in that same chapter, which seems to be a problem. Again, there's a textual issue there. And if you look at verse 11, we'll notice that that, that phrase is actually not there. And I think that's right and fair. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're talking with someone who's a King James only, you got another problem anyway. You have to work on that and uh, uh, with that person. But but in 21:6 we find it again. God speaking in this case, the one seated on the throne, verse five, who overcomes, I will be his God, and he will be my son. So this is God language, so to speak, uh, that uh, not Jesus language, and it is God who is Alpha and Omega. Uh, he's amazing and wonderful and in the two instances that are really actually uh, in the text uh, it's clearly God speaking in both cases. It's this third one we'll look at just for a second uh, in Revelation 22 13 that perhaps garners the most concern from people but uh, Revelation 22 13 I am the Alpha and the Omega the first and the last the beginning and the end so these are words proximate to Jesus talking at this point in Revelation. And, uh, and so people say, it must be Jesus then. And, okay, I think that probably uh, we wouldn't have to make that conclusion. We'll see what you think, see how you feel about it. Two possibilities that I believe are here uh, for our, our thinking. It actually still may be God here. And if it's God, what's going on is what I would call free interjecting voices. Uh, it, it's like the climax in a Greek play. You have all these characters on stage, and you hear this character saying something out, but there's no telling you who, which character you're hearing at what time. It would seem like it would just be a, you know, a contradiction. But actually, if you're watching the play and you're seeing the whole thing, you realize, oh, wait a minute, that was a different person speaking than the one who just spoke the line before. Actually, I think that we can find uh, examples of this in the Hebrew Bible and in other places uh, where that, particularly in Isaiah, you'll find some instances where the, the voice shifts without it any direction or announcement. You've got to realize it's just God speaking. Oh, no, wait a minute, now it's Isaiah speaking. Or wait a minute, it's the, the future coming Messiah speaking in spirit. And so, uh, but it's not always announced. It's not always so clear. And that could well be what we're looking at here. Uh, so here's one even in verse 20 of the same chapter. Yes, I'm coming quickly, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. 
Wait a minute. Who's coming quickly? Is it John? The writer? Uh, is it someone else? No, we said, well, no, we understand. It's the one here that's coming quickly. That is Jesus. And we see that by the context, the greater picture. And, uh, and then the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. So, yeah, we can understand by context. This is not a big problem. Uh, but it's interjecting voices. Interesting. And that's almost like the revelation is like a grand finale in, in, in a way. And you see, I can almost see it like a, a Greek play, uh, where the, you have this voice speaking out. God is saying this. Jesus is saying that. The writer is saying this, and on and on. Some angel is speaking. And it's not always, by this time, we figure you've known who the characters are, and so who's saying what? You can say, oh, well, okay, that's God in that case. So perhaps that's the case in the instance we're looking at in Revelation, where you have this uh, Alpha and Omega, the third time, as I said. On the other hand, if it is Jesus speaking, I don't know that it really represents a problem to us exactly. Uh, certainly nothing that we would shake the universe over and create another God person over. It's just not uh, sensible. It, but it's kind of to me, at least I think of it this way, and what I would call parallel language, for lack of a better term. Somebody could give me a better term. But it's like this. A lot of arguing goes this way. God is king, Jesus is king, so Jesus is God. Ha, huh. okay. Now we say, well, God is king, David is king, so David is God. Oh, no, well, no, no, wait a minute. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. So what we have is a difference in the use of the word king. God is innately king. We know that. He's king in and of himself, all right? But David and Jesus are given their thrones, their crowns, by God. Different category of king, different use of the word king. So that's why I'm saying, I don't think it's really a particularly great problem if you say Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, because there's a sense in which he is. So let's think about that. If that is the case, Jesus is also first and last. We could say he's Alpha and Omega of the new creation of his people. He's the first, right? The first in order, the first in time, and the first in priority. So here we are. But he is the one who died in Revelation 2 and 8. Okay. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this. Ha, first and last. First and last, how, what? Like first and last in the universe? Not exactly. He's first and last in God's new creation. First and last in this new resurrection, in the resurrection. So very powerful. So you can look at some of these thoughts, and if you haven't thought about it before, uh, look into it a little bit. And uh, again, I like uh, Hebrews 12 and 2, which can go sort of to this effect, but he's the author and finisher of not the universe, but of our faith. So uh, he is the first in this new creation of God. So that makes sense. So yeah, in that sense, he could be an Alpha and Omega. You'd have more than one just being used in a different way, a different sense. So uh, we have then this case, Revelation 3.14, Jesus identifies himself as, quote, the beginning of the creation of God. And uh, I won't spend much time on this, but the, the key phrase here is the word arche, which actually has a, uh, which is not the modern Greek pronunciation. But anyway, the, uh, uh, but here we are and it has a, a wide spectrum of meanings and significance. It can be the first in terms of a series, okay? And so that would be the beginning of the creation. That's still a little confusing. But it also may have been first place and first in terms of rule. So I, in this case, I don't think I would ever hear myself saying this, but the NIV, I think, gets it right. The, uh, they, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation, it is still God's creation, not his. So I, I think what we're seeing here is, uh, you could look at the text a little bit and think about it some, and uh, maybe help your friends with, with that. There's more, but maybe we should stop at this point. But, uh, so I'm just kind of coming off of things that we hear our viewers talking about, and uh, things that we uh, connect with people about. 
what's on their minds. So, uh, and that's all I have to say about that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You're very welcome.